Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be continuing our uh, the finale of our coverage of the great conversation between uh, Will Eisner and Frank Miller. But first, I want to invite you guys to like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I want you to hit that uh, bell icon so that we can notify you when new videos are available to help mitigate that kayfabe effect, which is whenever we put these videos out in the morning, the people who get first dibs on the books that we're talking about uh, are notified. Uh, and by the end of the day, those comics we talk about could be prohibitively expensive if you, could, if you could find them at all online. Man, one of my favorite things to do, Jimmy, is the night before we put a video out live, go on eBay, see how many copies are there, and it feels good when they're all gone by lunchtime. Uh, if you watch these videos by uh, incomplete, uh, what that does is uh, pushes the YouTube algorithms uh, for the videos out to other uh, comic book loving YouTube viewers. And that just helps us grow our numbers in leaps and bounds, which has been happening a lot lately. Jimmy, congratulations on 60,000 subscribers. Let's go uh, to 600,000. Yes. You know, like, yeah. like I'm, 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 I like how you think Ed. I, I play with exponents, man, because this is uh, the internet, like billions of people use the internet. Anyhow, Jimmy, let's, uh, let's jump into the final pieces of the Eisner Miller conversation. If you guys go to the link, uh, in the description below, you will be able to find the previous, I think, four or five parts to um, our coverage of this book. We've been going through five chapters apiece, and we are at the last five, man, beginning with some talk about editors between Will Eisner, Frank Miller, man. Uh, what kind of value do you place in your editor? Uh, both guys, I think, are in some some agreement in in certain ways. Uh, for a fresh fresh brain, basically, man. Uh, Will Eisner appreciates uh, editors as a surrogate for the reader. Yeah, Miller describes uh, his relationship with Diana Schutz, his longtime editor at Dark Horse, as cheerleader, proofreader, critic. You know, so yes, a fresh set of eyes and somebody you trust. Yes, to to give you that feedback. Um, it's interesting, this chapter to me, because this is, I don't know, not quite a page into it. And Eisner brings up deadlines and they spend the rest of this chapter talking about deadlines, schedule, figuring out timing. And I think, you know, I say that because it's just an emphasis on the production history of comics and how vital it was that you hit those deadlines because you'd have your press time scheduled and you pay for it, whether your book was ready to go on that press or not. Yeah. Um, but it's still, you know, it also speaks to that idea of like, you're promising people stuff. You yes. got to know how long it takes you to deliver this. And there's a lot of talk about that, about schedules and how they work and how they figure out how long it takes them to work. The conversation does go into that place and they don't explicitly say it, but that is kind of a big function of of an editor, certainly of the big two to kind of keep the trains running on time, man. And, and to, you know, be a stopgap to... Uh, deliver to deliver these these books on time um uh when they talk about the schedule delivery of uh, artwork it then goes into some of the process stuff which is basically like how far into a book are you in completion before you start soliciting and doing all of that kind of thing yeah and there's some really interesting talk about dark knight 2 yeah because um i remember a big delay in that one yes 9 11 happened during that publication which added to it according to miller and i, I kind of remember that you know there was some weird like what the content of that book was versus you know terrorism at that time and then furthermore miller wasn't done with the book whenever they started promoing the book which he, so there's a which he didn't of, want right and, and for good reason, and he explains what that is like of, you know, having to do, like, interviews with people and then try to work on a page, you know, before that or around that schedule. Um, that's nightmare stuff. Like, it's, it's tough. Like, it's just too much. It's tough. Like, I mean, you have to do it, you know? Like, like I, I you know, pay a guy to, to, like, corral those interviews and stuff for me. And at least back then, at least back then, the interviews are over the phone. Now there is a portion of the publicity that the onus is on you to like, you're typing your answer. You're doing three quarters. They're asking you a 10 word question and you're writing 50 to a hundred words per answer. You're doing all the work. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> right. and, and you're doing that on top of trying to keep the schedule. We did uh, the, the final issue of Watchmen with Dave Gibbons and and they had a whole schedule li lined up for themselves that everything was agreed upon until it wasn't. And then 
uh, you know, the book ends up being late because they start putting it out too early. Yeah, and it's really hard to explain that maybe if you've never done it, but I always think like the, the promo of a book, like start your next book before you get into Absolutely. the promo cycle. Because Absolutely. Because it just, if you don't have something going, if you don't have that momentum, it's really hard to start a new project in the middle of that promo. I think I think uh, after Red Room, like I really wanted this to be a monthly, and I gave myself uh, like a year lead time and had all these issues finished. But when it started coming out, it's just no hope, you know. Like there was just no hope. I think I am going to like powder out, put stuff online on a regular basis, and like drum up interest that way, but not start publishing until I have like twelve issues worth. That is, if the pamphlet comic is still a viable thing that comic shops are buying. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comics that Ed Piscor and I make. So here's a rundown of what is available. Hulk, Grand Design, Monster, and Madness, a retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, is available in comic shops everywhere right now, including some very cool variant covers by Peach Momoko, Jeff Darrow, Ed McGinnis, Marcos Martin, and Cartoonist Kayfabe's own Ed Piscor, in addition to my covers. You can also find the Deadly Scroll Live, Street Angel, and a variety of oversized hardcovers from Image Comics, Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard, and The Plain Janes, uh, one of the first young adult graphic novels published here in the United States about a bunch of high school artists that get in trouble around their town doing public art. From Ed Piscor, Red Room, the antisocial network collecting the first series of uh, Red Room comics, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, Trigger Warnings, Red Room's second season now in stores. Two or three issues available already, and uh, a fourth one on the way coming soon. Banned in uh, 22 countries and 10 comic book shops, but those shops will still order these comics. You just may have to ask for them by name. They may come uh, out from under the counter whenever you ask for those, wrapped in a brown paper bag. He's also the originator of the Grand Design series. There are three oversized Beautiful volumes of X-Men Grand Design currently available wherever books and comics are bought and sold, as well as Hip Hop Family Tree, four oversized volumes of this hip hop history and available in deluxe box sets, very nice box sets, and WYSIWYG, a history of computer hacking available wherever books and comics are sold. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Let's jump into Hollywood, Jimmy. Yeah, and of course Miller having some experience in Hollywood going back all the way to the 80s when he's writing RoboCop sequels and living in L.A. So uh, speaking about something he knows closely. Yeah, yeah, but it's a very meandering conversation because certainly, I mean, it's... it's Like, Eisner has nothing to do with this. There was, like, a made-for-TV spirit movie. I can't find a damn thing about it. Like it's the first time I'm hearing about yeah, it. Yeah, you can find screenshots and you could even find trailers and stuff, but... Surprisingly, nobody taped it on VHS or Betamax off the TV uh, and digitized it to put on YouTube yet. Yeah, maybe maybe it's up there right now. It's interesting the perspectives these guys bring about Hollywood. Um, you know, they adapt stuff. They adapt books. They adapt, uh, you know, comics. In some ways, they even adapt the screenplays, right? You know, the writers that put that stuff out. And both of them come from that angle. Um, Miller, you know, carries a lot of shame, I think, about comic books and kind of puts that on of... Hollywood being like vindication or something, you know, that, that a lot of people view it as. And um, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's, I feel like that's changed a lot in, in our, because I don't feel that kind of idea of like, if you want your project, your comic book to be validated, it needs to go through the Hollywood machine. I know there was a time for that and there are probably still people that feel that way. There's I don't feel is. that way. Yeah, I don't feel that way either. I think, I think people get that energy from us that, that we don't, but of course they do, man. There's all kinds of people taking $30,000 Netflix deals Well, that's and the shit. thing, too. You know, I think there's a myth of money there. Right. Um, that money is just not what everybody thinks it is. Yeah, I mean, you have to be Ninja Turtles, you have to be Walking Dead right. to, like, really have that thing that can sell your, your books in perpetuity. Yeah, a lot of this stuff is, you know, you sign away those rights for, who knows, maybe 50 k or something, but that's it. All, yeah, all it is ultimately is it commercial for your books and by the so, way so licenses you, come in much smaller you know take a zero off of there there are a lot of licensing out there for like five thousand dollars they start licensing like no thanks yeah what does yeah that get yeah you? absolutely and and you know what you could take your shopping agreements and wipe your assholes with that stuff man because that's the guys that want zero dollars to take your stuff and uh we'll give you some money if they place it somewhere so all that stuff is cornball uh 
Miller in the body of the conversation is talking about like I'm not gonna like do anything with Sin City until uh until I'm done with it. Like I've been approached, blah blah blah, but I'm not uh, quick to uh sell it or turn it into a film. And here he is right here with the chick playing Goldie. So like clearly transcribing the book, getting it all together, took some time after uh the conversation was initially held. Yeah, a few years. Um he does talk about you know, it, he he describes it as like work for hire, but Hollywood pays better, yeah. a lot better. Um, so, you know, there is that part of it, and he's pretty clear about that. You know, it's a very uh, glamorous, there are glamorous elements there, and that does include the pay. So right. if you look at it as work for hire, it pays better than comics work for y- hire. Yes, and, and one of the parts he's talking about in relation to that is that uh, prominent editors have told him that the stuff that I uh, absolutely suspected, that the comic book... Uh, the whole facility of the comic book publishers, the big two, is to be a research and development wing for these future properties. Now, he's saying this before there was like an Avengers or whatever. I guess maybe the X-Men movies out, maybe that Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. But it's not that big, the the big machine of Marvel Studios. And I think like whenever, uh, it was within the past year, year and a half, Jim Lee all but said that in interviews after big layoffs and stuff like that. Like, hey, we're still keeping the comics going and and, uh, essentially said that it's basically just a bunch of job guys doing research and development for throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what might be the next uh, Gwenpool or something. This is a great uh, two-page spread right here, Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> Miller looks like such a comic book nerd in that picture. I mean, those are obscenely <laughs> short shorts. Like, the, like those shorts uh, are an abuse to the Comics Book Code Authority because <laughs> because if this was a high-def pick, man, we might, you know, those yam bags might be sticking out of those gimmicks. It's hilarious. You know what's neat in that picture to me is that, uh, like, the helmet part. It just looks like a tinfoil hat It person. totally does. <laughs> it totally does. And it's. I'm sure that's done for effect, you know, the way that movie looks. Like, I bet a lot of the props have that quality if you see them under regular light of, like, what? That's what it looks like? <laughs> that's kind of a magic movie. There's some stuff they do in there that's just, uh, you know, visually hard to believe. Yeah. We could jump to uh, managing the career. I think we covered all the Hollywood bits, man. And uh, this is this is that part. See, they sort of powder out the conversation in a certain way because because Frank Miller has all these ideas. Like you know, you, you go to you go to work. Like the tried and true formula, which which I guess still kind of rings true a little bit if you look at the successes over at Image Comics or something. Is you do your tenure at the big two, build an audience base, bring a portion of them with you to your creator own stuff. He lays that out, but then he hedges a little bit later and is like, that could be obsolete for all I know. This this is how I got in. Like, I have no idea. It reminds me, I mean, you know, when we interviewed McFarlane, it was the same, he gave a same version of that. You know, that idea of like, do your, your uh, monthly book at Marvel for X amount of time and build that audience. Um, I don't know. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I have no idea. It's not what I did, so I can't speak to that. And yeah. also, like, you don't see artists doing a monthly run the way they used to anymore. And I don't know if that's by design of the publishers, by the artists, by what. I have no idea. But I don't know if that model even can exist exactly like it used to. It was certainly more meaningful when those comics would all be published in six-figure range. Because let's, you know, take 1% of those people with you. You're going you're gonna to have a, a decent little base to to sort of uh there's some stuff that impresses me with these guys like i don't know future visions where um you know miller says that thing you said about comics are changing so much we have no idea exactly what is coming up and eisner chimes in it won't be one thing it'll be a whole business and i think that's true you know because like we talk now like like just a minute ago of yeah go get that monthly gig and then go to image okay sure or go get your agent and go to Scholastic. You know, like there are all these different models. Get get a giant following on Webtoons. You know, like there are several different models now at this point. And I think Eisner's right about it. It'll be a whole business. The, and, and I kind of love that. The internet comes up in conversation here. And this is like still very early. This is HTML internet. No social media internet. And they're talking about all the stuff that you could uh, imagine. Uh, Miller describes it as a Tower of Babel. Yep. Where there is a place for everybody. So the... The uh, challenge there is one, no money. You're putting it up on your on your uh, instas or whatever. And two is um, white noise. How how do you separate yourself from from the white noise? Like whenever um, I 
was repurposing WYSIWYG and putting it, make, making it a, a weekly comic strip and doing all the widgets and stuff with WordPress and putting in ad money for these like weird comic, uh, web comic websites, the most popular stuff you've never heard of. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, good stuff came from those areas, man. You had Octopus Pie come through that stuff. You had Harka Vagrant come through those channels also. But they weren't even close to the most popular shit. And the most popular stuff, like these guys, they fully exist in a space that doesn't even have to do with, with print. It's it's getting $1 uh, Patreon um, blasts from... 20,000 people right a month you know that that sort of that's, that's their model me. um you know you mentioned white noise the other word i'd use for that is competition because now it's like it's not just the uh 40 books that came out new on wednesday it's like the 12,000 new comics that were posted this hour yeah but you know? most of them so suck ass how, how do so. you uh get the eyeballs yeah but most people don't even bother looking at 12,000 to go hey but these are the four that are good you right know, you got to figure out a way to stand out of that or to get those eyeballs um, another thing Eisner adds, and these dudes are kind of astute in some of this. I feel like it's really come to be. He says what he thinks is happening is the field is breaking into small specialized segments. Yeah. And I mean, that is true of everything. Yeah. You know, like the monoculture is over. And uh, pretty good for Eisner weighing in on this in the last couple years of his life here. As an old sage, I mean, he's seen, like, he mentions it, right? Like, people didn't think that the Saturday, even Saturday Evening Post wasn't going to go away. And to you or I, we're like, that was never a magazine in our lifetime. But to, in his day, when Norman Rockwell's painting fucking covers for that shit, when it's the biggest thing out, like, it had to be a shock. So in our time, like, when time and life and all these other magazines were just going away, like, he's he's... He's seen it all, dude. It's uh, it's wild. He throws some shade at Bill Griffith's Zippy. How, how <laughs> I'm shocked keep, by that. How did that keep going for twenty years? <laughs> it's 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 a piece of what do you call it? like a piece of mainstream culture, and I don't understand why. Yeah, it doesn't know how it became a viable commercial property. That's it. <laughs> but it's amazing to think of Bill Griffith in his last twenty years, like since this interview, what he's done. I feel like. His greatest comics come after this, but he's already very successful at this stage. This so, so successful, Eisner's baffled. We by his we success. gotta we gotta have Bill Griffith on here, man, because since he since he came to town when he was promoting that that first graphic novel, he's done two or three graphic novels since, and maintains a daily comic strip. He's doing more work in his later years than he's ever done in his life. It's all strong. He allows for his id to be expressed in Zippy, but these graphic novels are straight up, clearly narrated, good comics without without any of that hyperbole of, of Zippy. Uh, I don't understand how he has the energy. I don't know how he does it. Yeah. It's wild stuff. We we need we need to totally we need to investigate. Yes. I whatever just, whatever he's doing, I need to do. I just made a note of that, man. I'm gonna reach out to him after this. Uh, another note that Eisner adds is um Beyond the industry part, just thinking of comics kind of as an art form, the use of imagery as a storytelling device will probably expand because society is moving into an era in which time is of the essence and we must tell a story quickly. Um, love it. You yeah. know, again, like this is a guy who's been doing it for, at this point, 60 years and spot on. Yeah. And I mean, like, this is a comment we could make right now. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So a lot of stuff kind of uh, going between industry versus art form and uh pretty insightful you know i i think most of it has come to be in a lot of ways and it is funny to think about like uh no one in 1925 could predict there would even be comic books yes yeah yeah like they weren't expecting that to be to be anything it was just like a like a like a mid-road to something else uh miller <laughs> talking about like what he would hope for the future i want to see sin city next to mickey spillane rather than next to spawn this is an argument that's come up a lot. Whenever we did Plain Janes the first time through, that was an issue that Random House, who was distributing at the time, had we struggled with. Like, where do you shelf this in a bookstore? And bookstores had policies then where it was like, it can only be shelved in one place. So you can put it in young adult, or you can put it in graphic novels. And it's like, you know, that's a tough... Finding it is, is, is more of an issue now than it's ever been. You go down to your uh, Barnes Noble right this minute, um, you will find the cartoon history of the universe books, like in with more like reference books. It's not in comics. You will not find Persepolis. That may be telling, by the way, because that's a book that's been in print yeah. for decades. You you uh, 
you will not find Persepolis like with the graphic novels unless somebody misshelves it. It's over in some other memoir section mm-hmm. or something like that. Mouse is in Barnes & Noble, but it's not in the graphic novel section. So there are these ones that go there. But when you talk to Spiegelman or you talk to, to uh, these other authors, they're not thrilled with that, really. Well, that feels like a human nature uh, issue to Grass me. is greener gimmick? Yes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> whatever, whatever their situation is, there's room to complain about it. But uh, it's, it is funny when he says ne- sh- Shelf Sin City next to Mickey Spillane rather than Spawn, and Eisner laughs, and he's on board for that, too. Yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> the medium is not the comic book sitting next to Spawn. The medium is not the comic book we see today. Yeah, Eisner big into the communication part of comics, and uh, rightfully so. Coming out of like nonfiction comics makes sense that he would have that perspective. And we 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 cap things off, man. We're talking legacy. Eisner's quote, man. I feel a bit like Horatio Al- Alger. I worked hard. I didn't marry the boss's daughter, but I worked hard, kept my nose clean, did the right thing, saved my money. Ultimately, wound up being the chairman of the board. I love this page. Yeah. I have not read. Uh, that's from To the Heart of the Storm, and I haven't read that, but I love this formal element where, like, we're seeing the, the it's almost a word balloon coming off the page, and then he erases it. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, the legacy stuff, uh, you know, I, I talked to a lawyer this week about a will, and it is a weird thing to start to think about and consider, and, and you know, especially for IP, it's a different thing of who's the caretaker of this beyond you. It's It's one of those very, very sort of, it's a it's a nerve wracking thing to think about, man. And we know that that certain people are the executors of other people's estates, and that's how you get to have Wallywood's canon remain in print, or right, or uh, my his, his name is Savage gets to stay in print. Uh, it's also what happens when you know a family that really isn't steeped in comic book business is now the executor of your estate. And they don't know if the deal is good or not. So then you don't get, just as a for instance, you don't get the good Mobius comics in America because the price to what the publishers are willing to pay is too far off, too far afield. Uh, you don't know who else to talk to. Like, it's, it's dicey, man. So if you want your stuff to stay out there, like, you have to have somebody in place to just, like, have those conversations because, you know, my... My 75-year-old dad ain't going to know what to do with that. Yeah, right. My 20-year-old sister is not going to know what to do with Red Room comics when I'm dead. And I would like to have them stay stay around, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You work your ass off for this stuff. Like, let them stay in print forever. I mean, how many great books have we read where the authors were dead before I was even born? Right. Like, you need some... You know, ideally, if there's a legacy to be had... You need that stuff to be accessible beyond your life. And there are vultures out there. So you, so it has to be with somebody responsible that, that, that like, isn't going to take advantage of your wife or your your loved one. It's a different piece of the copyright uh, conversation, you know, that, that, that you hear so much in comics and especially with creators. And it's like, this is another piece of it. Yeah. Um, Miller makes a comment about stylistic restrictions on comics are far fewer than they used to be. It's only recently that the quote unquote house style has become one choice among many. Yeah. That's kind of a cool comment to drop in here. You know, talking about their legacies in terms of what has changed or maybe what changes they have sort of led to. Um, but I think that's kind of fun, that house style comment, because I don't know if it's better or not that we don't have the house styles for something like a shared universe like Marvel. Mm. You know, it's so chaotic to look at like a handful of books from one of these publishers. And without the house style, you wouldn't know that they were part of a, of a common world. I like this part where Will Eisner's talking about, you know, he's still, he's still very much in the game, mm-hmm. you know. And he's talking about how, like, back in the day, in early 40s or whatever, writing these spirit stories. I'm writing for a 14-year-old who grows up in the 70s to be 35 years old, 40 years old. Like, he has different concerns. I have to imagine that he's not trying to read Superman stories still. Let me try. <laughs> let me try to give him a comic that might speak to like those sensibilities a little bit. Yeah, dare to dream, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, there's some comments here about um, when Eisner comes back to the field. He he goes on a couple times about comic book conventions and how that blew his mind that there were comic book conventions. And so when he returns to comics in the '70s. Uh, he said he never dreamt that there would be conventions. He went to one of Phil Soling, the, the founder, really, of the direct market, 
one of his conventions at the Commodore Hotel on 42nd Street in New York, and it really blew him away. Man, 42nd Street, the 70s, like, there's a lot of stuff con con converging in this moment. <laughs> and it's kind of cool that Eisner observes it and, yeah. and recognizes, like, this is something. This is something I never saw coming. Look at this. Yeah, he has a very deep uh, interview with Phil Suling. It's on tape. Uh, it's on... Uh do a little plug for John B. Cook right here, man. This is the Blu-ray of uh, Will Eisner, Portrait of a Serial Artist. And the cool thing about Blu-ray is that uh, you can pack a lot of information on these discs. So with the extras that are included, you have the never-before-heard Shop Talk audio tapes that were transcribed into the Shop Talk book with people like Jack Kirby, Harvey Kurtzman, Kniff. And Phil Suling has a very substantial... Uh, interview in there talking about the the birth of the direct market and where he sort of got all those initial ideas it's really interesting those guys both like miller weighs in and says the early conventions felt like a meeting of a secret tribe uh eisner calls it a cult and miller says you know this is uh this was the the the, the feeling of those guys is quote they all hate us but we still love this and are sticking to it and we've said it a million times on this channel how like fandom wrote comics history. Like, yeah. There's a lot of stuff that would just be gone if it weren't for the fandom keeping that alive. And that's what they're describing here. And it's uh, comics have changed so much that even that fandom has changed quite a bit. It's amazing what was going on where this small group of, of, of lovers of comics kept the medium moving forward and advancing. You know, Phil Soling putting on conventions, blow Eisner's mind, then building the direct market. Like these are substantial bits that don't exist without that devout core. I'm going to go somewhere, Jimmy, with this, man. Uh, I think stuff like the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel is a further extension of that because how many people did we speak to? High-level creators. Just check our roster of shoot interviews, man. You can see the names. Uh, when we're just kind of talking uh, preamble-like and they're saying stuff to us like, never in a million years, these are people who had functioning 30-plus 40 plus year careers, man, saying stuff like, never would I have thought that there would have been 20,000 people that would watch a conversation with this guy or that guy, or there would be 50,000 people who would sit down and like listen or watch a review of a comic book, like never in a million years. That's, that's Heinz Field. You know, that's, that's the max seating at a Steelers football game watching you two nerds <laughs> talk about Wally Woods porno comics. <laughs> hey, I've been doing signings for Hulk, and I've, I hear it from every third person in line talks about how this channel has brought them back to comics or introduced them to new books or whatever, and I love hearing it because, yes. like, you're right about that extension. So much of fandom is what introduced me to various artists I like or books that I had never heard of before, so I'm happy if we're passing that forward, and it sure seems like we are. yes. I only uh, highlighted one quote. Uh, what is this quote? This Pe is a good one. People who have small egos can't do this kind of stuff. It requires not just an idea, but a confidence in yourself that the idea is worth pursuing book by book for a year of your life or so. I love this quote. Yeah. It, it really is something I never think about. Humility is something I grew up with as a virtue. And, and I'm uncomfortable with some of the ego stuff. But he's so right. You know, like you're taking a chance and what they go on and talk about is like, this is a field of rejection. Like yeah. you've got to be able to, to handle that and be prepared for it, which can, goes back to that ego thing where you just believe that this comic is good enough to be out there, to have a publisher, to have readers. Um, I love all of this. I think this is really insightful. Uh, it certainly was for me. Yes. Reading, reading this was insightful this week. It, it, it added a lot of illumination to, like, you know, the haves and the have-nots uh, in a way of the comics universe. Like the Ed Brubaker shoot interview we had where, where he talked about the two kinds of people who see somebody accomplish something. And there are the people who are like, they did that, so that means I could do that. And then there are the people who are like, that guy did it, fuck him, right. tear him down. Yes. We'll call that Twitter. Yes. You know what I mean? And it's like, these guys... You and I also, you look at the shelves and there is not empirical data that there is, the book you are working on is going to work. And it, by work, I'm saying it, won't, it might not be able to sell enough to keep your rent paid or whatever the fuck. You know what I'm saying? So you have to take that shot. You have to take that gamble and believe in yourself. And that line of confidence and self-delusion... Who knows where to draw that thing, man? Because then you get to like outliers like a George Lucas or like a Kanye West man who had detractors. 
up to the point where they create their thing and it becomes a massive success, now you don't want to listen to anybody. You can't trust anybody's words. I was going to say, like, there's a third person in the in the two people you just described, and that is the visionary. Yeah. That's the person that nobody that I've seen has done this, but I think it'll work. And I'm going forward with it. You know, it's it's inventing that uh, that new thing, the Star Wars, you know, uh, that everything then copies after the fact. But yeah, it's it's really interesting conversation, in, in, in my opinion, this part of it. And it's funny because, you know, this is the end of their interview. So I think you're catching this. This is uh, day two or three of hanging out and talking comics. And there isn't as much uh, substance, in my opinion, in these last five chapters. But that is a high point. I, I think that's a really good... Uh, insight into a cartoonist, into an author, an artist, anybody that's creating work and putting it in front of people, rejection is a, is a matter of course. Yeah. A real good book to, to comb through with you, James, and uh, some real good food for thought around the, uh, the, the entire step of the way. I encourage everybody to check out all the videos. I imagine that at one point I'll just cut together one massive video where people could go through all of this stuff. Um, checking out this last little bit here where we have the bibliographies of our guys, uh, it's letting me know where we're at with the channel. Let's, let's see here, man. I have the building, but we didn't do it. We did the dreamer. Uh, and I think that's really it with the Eisner stuff. We did like a Moby Dick, but I don't think that's on there. With, that's interesting. That's not on there. With Sin City. There's a lot, like there's Don Quixote. Like I have all that, uh, a bunch of like these weird 64 pages. We did first Sin City, second... We did Family Values. Didn't do 300 yet. That'll be a good one. Did both Dark Knights, Electra Lives Again. We didn't do Ronin yet. Did our Jeff Darrow joints. Man, I think these Dave Gibbons ones yes. will do well for us. Batman Year One. Didn't do Man Without Fear yet. We did Electra Assassin. I think we're batting 500 with the Frank Miller properties. Need to make up some ground with Will Eisner. I, yeah. I was going through my bookshelf. Do you, you have know, some of this stuff? I do have some of this stuff. Yeah, I have this in some some different forms. I have a variety. You know, like he's done so much stuff. Like I've got all kinds of Eisner and bits and pieces and, and different samples and things. Several of these books I have or I've read. Um, so definitely would like to. I'm eager to get back into Will Eisner. Yeah. Because that's stuff I read when I was younger. And in a lot of ways, I think I'm just more. Like he's writing to me now. Right. More than he was to me when I was 23. And so uh, I'm eager to revisit his stuff after going through this again and seeing some highlights of it. Um, obviously one of the great cartoonists, so eager to get back into that. Let's do it, man. I, I got maybe five of these books on the list, and we'll be happy to scoop up some more. Yeah, you, sounds good to me. Heck of a conversation, Jimmy. You good to go? Yeah, yeah, I am. I, I, I really enjoyed this book. It's something that I kind of overlooked when it first came out, and I'm uh, happy to spend some time with it and talking about it. Yes, yes. That, that's always the cool thing about these kind of books, man, is like you have the, the conversation at hand and then you have like our own experiences that, that we can uh, expand upon uh, together. Makes for a good conversation, good set of videos. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness should both be in comic book shops whenever you see this video. It's a retelling of the 60 year history of the Incredible Hulk through my eyes and hands. Uh, pick that up. Perfect for the longtime Hulk fan or the first time Hulk reader. And join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue one, two, and potentially issue number three are on the stands as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. And you can uh, get these comics at my uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three books for the archive there. Uh, I put them up there before they, they hit paper. Banned in 26 countries, banned in 10 comic shops. But if you hit that link tree, you could also uh, order and pre-order those comics if, if your uh, shop is fairly conservative and, and weak and doesn't like to make money. Jimmy, what else do we have out there? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Dude, given those marching orders, we'll be on our way. Make more comics. <laughs>